this is the first time I've actually ever done a, a, a video call uh, um, group seminar uh, session. So, um, so this is uh, this is quite new for me. Um, I haven't actually been um, teaching undergrads for the past two years. Um, I've only been supervising um, uh, masters, uh, MPhils, and PhDs via Zoom. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, having a group of people uh, to whom I'm presenting on Zoom is um, it's a little unusual for me. Um, I'll just say something about my background. Um, I, didn't, I did my PhD in architecture and um, I worked uh, with um, uh, Foucault's work and also with Walter Benjamin's work. And I worked in particular with Foucault because there is a very, very strong um, understanding of um, a spatiality to knowing and a spatiality to power. And at the time I was doing my, um, my PhD, uh, the, the notion that working with Foucault in architecture was something that was still relatively um, uncommon. Uh, now there's, um, there's, there's quite a bit of material around uh, in particularly um, the field of geography, uh, which is probably the leading field of study at the moment in uh, using Foucault scholarship. Um, and, so, um, and so Foucault's work that uh, leans to issues of space, spatializing and a politics of spatiality um, is, um, is, 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 has been quite important for me. Uh, and that, that's actually been the intersection for me with, um, with some people who work in education because I was, um, I was involved in supervising a PhD for somebody looking at uh, in innovative learning environments and wanting to work with um, a Foucauldian perspective or direction. And so, um, uh, so looking at uh, power knowledge relations in um, educational environments uh, from the point of view, not simply of um, teaching practices, learning practices, curriculum practices, um, uh, assessment practices, but the spatializing practices that are inscribed in the very architecture of uh, an educational facility uh, is something that um, this candidate was particularly interested in. Um, <clears throat> so so my, my background is not explicitly in education, though I've, uh, I've come to encounter uh, um, some educational thinking. And because I've been uh, myself uh, uh, an educator in tertiary institutions uh, for the past um, 30 or so years, um, I, um, uh, I feel a, a commitment to questions around education and pedagogy. Um, now, uh, in terms of what we want to do today, or what I would like to do today is, um, uh, I don't. I don't know how your reading group's going, and uh, I don't know if you're enjoying it or hating it. <laughs> you're finding Foucault is just not what you wanted to read, or whether Foucault is actually something quite interesting. I I, I, I don't know, um, and um, uh, I'm 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 hoping that uh, uh, Foucault is something that you uh, uh, have an interest in. Um, what I want to, to talk a little bit about was what Foucault was doing prior to 1975 when Discipline and Punish appeared. And I thought I would talk a little bit about um, his early books uh, and also something about uh, his lectures at the Collège de France, uh, which led up to the publication of Discipline and Punish. Uh, again, I don't know how widely you're looking at Foucault or how widely you're reading Foucault. If any of you have dipped into the Collège de France lectures or um, his, um, his uh, books prior to Discipline and Punish, um, History of Madness, 
which was his doctoral thesis. And that was published in 1961. Um, Birth of the Clinic was published in 1963. Um, the Archaeology of Knowledge was, um, no, sorry, The Order of Things was published in 1966. The Archaeology of Knowledge in 1969. Then there's a break of six years uh, where, um, for Foucault to produce discipline and punish. As, as, a, as, a, as a rather uh, simple overview of Foucault's career, we might say that the books he worked on up until, um, uh, and including the archaeology of knowledge in 1969, uh, are generally a term, what, what his archaeology phase, that is his phase where he's interested particularly in questions of um, uh, how it is that um, how it is that language is able to inscribe things in the world. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that um, in, in, in following up on, on some of um, some of that writing. Uh, and there, there, there's a break that happens in 1970. And that break is that Foucault is elected to a rather prestigious position at the College de France. The College de France, de France is a very prestigious uh, uh, research and it's not exactly a teaching institution because in the sense that the lectures that are given are public lectures, there, there is no, it's, it's, there are no, private students at the college, they're, they're public lectures, but he also, uh, um, but the, those who are elected to the college um, have to give a series of, it sounds quite good for an academic, uh, a series of 13 public lectures, and then they spend the rest of the year researching. And, uh, and then they have to give their 13 lectures the following year on what they've been researching. And so um, uh, Foucault is elected to the Collège de France in 1970. And after that, um, there, there is a, um, a shift in what, in, 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 in what he's doing. And that shift is in the early lectures, lecture courses at the Collège de France, a shift, increasing shift to moving away from questions of uh, what constitutes a knowledge of our world to what constitutes the forces that produce that knowledge of our world. So it's a shift from archaeology and archaeology of knowledge to a genealogy of power. And I'll say something more about that as well as we go. Um, in, in 1975, when Discipline and Punish is, is produced, if you actually look at the, the lecture course that Foucault is giving at the College de France, uh, which is um, uh, titled uh, Society Must Be Defended, you'll see that he has shifted dramatically in a sense, from questions of power and force that are inscribed in discipline and punish. And as, as you would um, by now recognize from that book that Foucault is particularly interested in how the individuated body is inscribed by relations of force. Um, and he shifts to a concern not with the individuated body, but with population. What constitutes population? And it's in 1975 that in the very final lecture of that lecture course that he introduces the notion of biopower. And from then on, Foucault's directions um, take up uh, 
fundamental questions about population. Hence, he announces um, after, after the publication of Discipline and Punish that he's about to embark on a six volume series on the history of sexuality. Now, why the history of sexuality? Because he's interested, he, he is interested in what constitutes um, the, 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 the processes, the normative and uh, power relational processes of constituting population. And the history of sexuality then takes him into uh, the direction of um, not questions of an archeology span of knowledge, nor questions of a genealogy of power, but questions of the transformations of a self. So from knowledge to power to self. And by, by 1980, Fuga in, in, in a famous article he wrote um, for, uh, as, a, as a postscript to a, a book by two American um, uh, Foucault scholars, um, Dreyfus and Rabinal, in 1980, he famously writes, um, what have I been dealing with all the time? It certainly hasn't been power, but it's been what constitutes the sub subjectification or the subjectivity of a self. So when you're reading Discipline and Punish, to get a sense that Foucault at some later point is going to be talking about an ontology of the self might seem a little strange. Equally, if you read uh, The Birth of the Clinic, uh, published in, um, in France in 1963, to think that Foucault would focus on a very Nietzschean problem of force would seem strange. So, so um, Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche, Foucault's whole um, uh, trajectory has been one of um, shifts and changes of um, coming to a certain point that abruptly shifting direction, um, which is probably a, um, uh, the hallmark of a, a good researcher. At least I like to think it is. Um, Okay, so, so what, what, I, what I wanted to particularly focus on in this session is, um, is what he was engaged with in um, some of that early work prior to Discipline and Punish. Um, and then what marked the um, movement to questions of, of power, and questions of, um, a particularly Nietzschean question of force. Um, okay, at th this point, uh, I'll, just, I'll just ask, um, uh, do you have any, any comments or, or questions or um, is this something that you particularly want to engage with? Because I can, engage, I can discuss uh, other aspects or respond to points you, you might want to make or whatever. I, for my own thinking, the, um, the transition that uh, Foucault makes from uh, Nietzschean will to power and force to his notion of power is I think a, a fascinating one um, that we can spend some time on, but um, that might be my own personal interest there. Um, I'm definitely uh, keen to hear um, about the Society Must Be Defended lectures, uh, just because they are so close in proximity to discipline and punish, um, but they mark uh, such a shift for him. Um, whereas discipline and punish, I think when we interact with that book thus far, it's sort of a closed project in a way. Um, it, it, it's this book that has a sort of beginning, middle and end. Um, but the Society Must Be Defended lectures, I think, are a bit easier to bleed out into um, a broader sense of his career. Um, that, that's just off the top of my mind. Um, and I'm okay. I, because I, I, I thought um, 
I thought, Tony, that um, uh, we, we might, uh, and this is what you and I talked about um, previously, um, that I might today talk about some of that earlier material and then at the end of Discipline and Punish, I might, uh, at the end of your, your reading group on Discipline and Punish, I might um, come back and say something about where Foucault goes after. Um, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so <clears throat> maybe we'll start with um, some some general comments on uh, on Foucault. Um, in, in a um, in an early interview Foucault gives um, in. Uh, the 1960s, this is prior to him uh, being elected to the Collège de France. Um, he, um, he says um, um, that, that while he prefers not to define himself, he is amused by the diversity of ways of being judged and classified. He adds that he has been positioned politically in a variety of often divergent positions. He's, and I quote him, I think I have in fact been situated in most of the squares of the political checkerboard, one after another and sometimes simultaneously as an anarchist, leftist, ostentatious or disguised Marxist, nihilist, explicit or secret anti-Marxist, technocrat in the service of Gaul Gaulism, new liberal and so on. None of these descriptions is important by itself, but taken together on the other hand, they mean something. And I must admit that I rather like what they mean. So, so um, uh, Foucault um, was, was a little bit of an enigma um, his book, The Order of Things, uh, it, it's interesting, he's, um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, History of Madness, um, written in 61, was his doctoral dissertation. Um, it was supervised by uh, a very distinguished um, historian of science, George Kongilhem. And Kongilhem, is it very important for uh, how he came to define what the biological sciences are, and in particular, the relation between uh, the norm and the pathological in the biological sciences. Now, this might seem uh, a rather obtuse point, but this ends up this notion of what constitutes uh, no, the norm or normalcy and pathology uh, comes ends up being extremely important for Foucault. Where, where what make what makes Congilham interesting is that uh, where we tend to think of the pathological as an aberration of of the norm, for Congilham the the pathological is what we always have, and the norm is a rarity. And so he somewhat reverses that relation that we tend to have between the norm and the pathological. And in fact, if um, there's, uh, you can read Con Con Gielhem's book on the normal and the pathological, and Foucault has an introduction to it, which is uh, extremely enlightening. And, um, uh, one of the lecture courses Foucault gives, of course, in um, uh, probably while he's drafting up Discipline and Punish is the lecture course Abnormals. And um, so, so, um, so Congilham was a very, very important thinker of the life sciences that tended to um, uh, impact on Foucault and Foucault's engagement with, ultimately his engagement with um, 
a, a perennial question of what's the relation between uh, medical discourse and juridical discourse, or what's the relation between um, medical knowledge and the law. Um, okay. Uh, uh, after uh, um, after uh, um, History of Madness, um, Foucault writes um, The Birth of the Clinic. His concern in Birth of the Clinic is what constitutes a transformation in the 18th century with uh, what he termed the medical gaze, or how it is that a transformation happens in the 18th century from an, a certain approach to understanding medical knowledge in the body to one that is completely shifted over the space of about 50 years to an understanding of medical knowledge and the body that we would recognize today. If you remember the beginning of Discipline and Punish, where he contrasts dramatically a certain form of punishment, and then he says 50 years later, he gives the timetable for, for prison, a day in prison. Um, and he contrasts this dramatic shift that happens sometime in the 18th century um, between two orders of knowledge or two ways of understanding the world. Um, and, and so, so the, the opening of Discipline of Punish is a little bit like a repetition of the opening of the birth of the clinic. In the birth of the clinic, he gives an account of the treatment of a patient, which when we read it, we think it's absolutely barbaric. And then how that treatment is thought 50 years later. Um, he, he then, uh, he discovered that nobody was particularly interested in these two books. He didn't become famous. Um, he then wrote uh, The Order of Things. The Order of Things, its French title is Les Mots et les Choses, titled Words and Things. And his concern in that is, I, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the order of things. It is a, quite an extraordinary book. Um, it is, uh, a, um, if you like, a history of the transformations in European understandings of knowing from the Renaissance to modernity. And he focuses particularly on the shifts from what he calls the classical age, which is the 17th and 18th centuries, and the shift from the classical age to the modern age from the 19th century. And it's <coughs> quite, um, uh, it's, it's, it's beautifully written. It is beautifully written. And, um, and lo and behold, it became a bestseller in France, like for two years, top of the best-selling book list. And he was suddenly really famous. Um, but I, I'd like to focus just briefly now on the birth of the clinic to, to get a sense of what was Foucault's project prior to his concern with how an exercise of power produces uh, um, a disciplinary mechanism. And um, um, I, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be talking here about what Foucault means by the birth of the clinic. But I'd like you to, while I'm, while I'm describing this, think about how you would translate this into something like the birth of the schoolroom. How, how a certain relation between an order of discourse and uh, bodies that have to be engaged with to be educated find one another. Um, just while I mentioned the birth of the schoolroom, um, 
there's a there, there, there's a journal um, that was um, a very short lived journal by um, edited by Colin Gordon, who was a very one of the really early Foucault scholars from the Anglo world. The journal is called Ideology and Consciousness. The title itself is a leftover from <clears throat> or hang on from when British uh, um, intellectual cultural theory was Marxist. Ideology and Consciousness sounds like the title for a Marxist journal. But in fact, it's a, a journal that introduced the work of Foucault. And I, I'm saying this because one of the issues of it has a, a 50 page article titled ex explicitly The Birth of the Schoolroom by two British Foucauldian scholars. Um, it was written in 1979. So uh, Discipline and Punish is translated in 1977. So it's not that long after Discipline and Punish. Um, ideology and Consciousness, um, I, I, I subscribed to it when it came out in the um, late 70s. Uh, and, um, uh, but I imagine it's online. Um, so I, I, I can send Tony, I, I want to mention a few things, but I'll send Tony a list of them so for following up. Both of the schoolroom. Okay. So, so, so what's, what's, what's Foucault's question in when he talks about the birth of the clinic? By clinic, he means the birth of what we come to understand now and simply take for granted as the space of medical practice, the clinic. Um, he says, um, uh, the, the, the preface to the book opens with, this book is about space, about language and about death. It is about the act of seeing the gaze. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, then he goes on to say, in order to determine the moment at which the mutation in discourse took place, we must look beyond its thematic content or its logical modalities to, to the region where things and words, and remember the book he will follow up with is precisely called Th Words and Things. The region where things and words have not yet been separated and where at the most fundamental level of language, seeing and saying are still one. We must examine the original distribution of the visible and invisible insofar as it, is, it, as it is linked with the division of what is stated and what remains unsaid. We must place ourselves and remain once and for all at the level of the fundamental spatialization and verbalization of the pathological. The spatialization and verbalization of the pathological, where the loquacious gaze with which the doctor observes the poisonous heart of things is born and communes with itself. Okay, so <clears throat> The problem Foucault poses is he discusses the, he, 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 he frames the problem in terms of um, a series of, um, a, a series of spatial uh, relations. He says, on the one hand, there is the space of discourse, the space of the discourse of medical knowledge. You might equally think there is the space of the discourse of educational knowledge. And then there is the spacing of a disease in the body. Those two spaces have no relationship to one another. How does the spacing of a medical discourse and the spatializing of a body, <clears throat> how did these two find their moment of configuration? He speaks of a primary space of discourse 
a secondary space of the body. What stops them? Um, what's, what stops them um, missing one another? In fact, they can so easily miss one another. Foucault says there, there is required or, or what was then perceived as the birth of the clinic was a third space, a tertiary space, a space not of, not of, of, of uh, a prescribed knowledge, nor of bodies that are diseased, but a tertiary space, which is a space of practices, a space of practices that bring the discourse of bodies and the body itself into relation with one another. And what Foucault is, is primarily concerned with it every aspect of his research is not the order of knowing. He's not an idealist, nor the materiality of bodies. He's not a materialist, but the practices that bring the ideality of knowing and the materiality of bodies or the materiality of things into a relation. Prior to knowing, we practice. That is, we act. And he's interested in what constitutes those practices. And so you, you will see when, when you're reading Discipline and Punish, he's, 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 not, inter he's not interested in what is, what is the, the formal order of discourse of penology. Nor is he interested precisely in the material conditions of, of, of prisons or bodies. He is interested in what are those practices that constitute the regimes of sequestration or disciplinarity or habit forming of, of both those who supposedly know what they're doing and those who are supposedly the objects of that, that knowing. So what are those practices that happen? And, and, um, uh, and, and, so, and so already with the birth of the clinic, he is interested in the notion of practices. So, um, up until uh, the archaeology of knowledge, um, he is interested in how um, those practices, or should I say, if you like, discourse itself is a practice. We tend to think of discourses as um, content, as something to know. But the moment we, he, as I said, he says, um, in order to determine the moment in which the mutation in discourse took place, we must look beyond its thematic content or its logical modalities to the regions where things and words have not yet been separated. That is, for there to be a mutation, at a certain moment, things and words are not separated. So, so we are not looking at, when we think of discourse as a practice, we are not looking at the content or modality or logic of that discourse. Um, and you might think of, um, in a sense, the, the question of educational practices in a similar way. How is it that how is it that a curriculum and those and those 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 bodies, those student bodies, 
find one another. There is a tertiary space, which is the space of particular, in this case, uh, habit forming discipline, disciplinary mechanisms that produce uh, on the one hand, the student as abnormal, if they weren't abnormal, then there would be no need to normalize them, to educate them. Um, on the one hand, uh, and on the other, um, the endless task of defining what that order of discourse is in relation to the pathologies of the objects of that discourse. And so the, the, the um, uh, um, uh, how many times have you encountered the situation where uh, curriculum reform happens in relation to the aberration of um, those, um, those situations or bodies, or even the spatializations of those bodies in, um, in ever refined and new learning environments. Uh, after, after um, as I mentioned, uh, after uh, the birth of the clinic, Foucault um, writes The Order of Things, in which he, he explores um, the, uh, um, what he calls uh, the epochal shifts of the episteme. That is the fundamental ordering of knowledge that constitutes uh, a form of knowing that he classifies as Renaissance, then a form of knowing that it classifies as classical, in the 17th and 18th century, then a form of knowing that it classifies as modern. And he's looking at the breaks and discontinuities or the mutations and transformations in the order of knowing. Um, through, throughout, um, uh, from, from, um, History of Madness, right through to his lecture courses at the Collège de France in 1977, 78, and 79. So over that entire period from the early 60s to the late 70s, um, Foucault keeps returning to the same time period in European history. The cusp of a fundamental transition in the 18th century. Um, from um, a, uh, an order of knowing that, um, that in, 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 in terms in which you would have encountered in Discipline and Punish, an order of knowing that is still um, engaging with sovereign power to a break in the 18th century to what he, he terms um, disciplinary mechanisms um, or a break in a fundamental break in how power itself is exercised. So, so um, from, um, uh, from the constitution of um, uh, confinements with respect to insanity through to um, his concerns with the emergence of the biopolitical. This particular period uh, between the, he sometimes gets a little bit fuzzy, but say from the beginning of the 18th century through to the end of the 18th century, uh, he keeps returning here to how transformations happen. Um, and I think that's, um, it's, it's worth, it's worth uh, 
exploring that a little bit. Um, and we can talk more about uh, the impact of some of those transformations when we come back to talk about uh, the work of Foucault after Discipline and Punish. Um, are, there, are there any questions at all? I, 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 yeah. Uh, maybe just a quick one. First of all, thank you very much for, for what you interpreting through Foucault's work. I'm finding it fascinating. <clears throat> um, I, I have a background in, in health and I, I'm a speech and language therapist and audiologist. And so I'm particularly intrigued by the medical gaze and how that's been used with Foucault uh, to understand the body. But what I'm appreciating from what you're speaking about is with regards to how that became a meme for understanding things across domains of practice. So is it correct in assuming that that, that, that position of the body uh, and how you've described it uh, may be used in, in an appropriate way to understand education and subjects in education in the same way a medical subject is understood as well as other domains of practice? And, and maybe just look, hear a little more around how your understanding of this has happened across, if, if this is what has happened. Um, uh, yeah, well, um, we might say, let's say uh, I'll hedge my bets and say yes and no. Um, I mean, yes, in the sense that um, if one looks at, um, if, if one looks at education as the practices of normalization, um, and one looks at uh, medical practice as a practice of the normalization of pathologies, then yes. But, 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 but clearly there's also uh, um, specific differences in the institutional configurations. Because what, what, what Foucault's interested in, when, when I emphasize that tertiary space, that's the birth of the clinic. The clinic is that tertiary space. The, the, the birth of the prison, the prison is that tertiary space. And so, uh, at a certain moment, the birth of the schoolroom, the schoolroom is that tertiary space. Now, um, that tertiary space is itself unstable. And so, so the clinic wasn't set in, in once and for all. The clinic itself is, is, a, is a mutation that's, that's happening. The, the prison is a mutation that's happening. The, um, uh, the educational facility is a mutation that's happening. But at the same time, um, if we think of them as that tertiary space in relation to uh, an order of discourse and uh, the, the, the material instantiation of these bodies that are a problem, the bodies are a problem. Um, the body of the school kid is a problem. Otherwise the school kid wouldn't have to go to school. Um, the body of the prisoner is a problem. Otherwise the prison, um, uh, yeah, so, um, so, 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 so one, one would keep uh, a relative difference while looking at um, the, the continuity of those mechanisms. Yeah. So if I'm reading you correctly, the underlying notion of pathology and the way in which a body is pathologized in education or any other sort of tertiary institution, if you put it that way, is is a is something that's a thematic it's, it's a concept that runs throughout the the work for Foucault and can be applied I'm just trying to find about the legitimacy of the concept within education and and and, and how much yeah, we can I, I, I actually think mm. um, um, the the text to really look at in mm. this is his lecture course at the College de France at normals because in that he, he looks at, he's looking particularly at, at childhood and what constitutes the abnormality mm -hmm. of children, how, how children are classifiable. And he goes into great detail about uh, uh, education in, in the um, late 18th and early 19th century in France uh, and about what constituted the practices of education and how the abnormality of students was defined and what happens to those abnormals in relation to what, what is supposedly the normalcy 
of students. And I, I really think you, you would get a, a wealth of, um, of an approach to Foucault's thinking in that. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's also important that um, um, he, um, he starts, um, he really starts dealing with uh, the uh, panopticism, uh, which is, of course, the theme, major theme in Discipline and Punish. He starts dealing with panopticism in his third lecture course at the Collège de France, titled The Punitive Society. And uh, I, again, this is something I would rec I, I, I suggest everybody takes a look at. He actually introduces Bentham in the following lecture course, and really early in the following lecture course. And the, uh, the Punitive Society is in 72, 73. The following lecture course is titled Psychiatric Power. And it's at the beginning of psychiatric power that he introduces Bentham. Um, uh, but the punitive society, by the, I, 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 this is something I'll send to Tony. Um, the last lecture in the punitive society, um, in the last lecture, and right at the very end of the last lecture, he suddenly stops. He, do, he does this on occasion in his lecture course. He suddenly stops and he says, it is now time to talk about power. To situate the problem, I would like to note four types of theoretical schemas that seem to me to govern analyses of power and from which I would like to distinguish myself. So he goes through and he describes in detail four understandings of power that are the doxa, that, that for the most part, Marxists, liberals, radicals, whoever, hold to. And he distinguishes his work from those. And I, I think, no, no, this is, this is in 1973. And, his, and then at the beginning of, of um, his lecture course, at the end of 73, going into, because his lecture courses are over um, their winter. So they begin in November and finish in March. Um, so at the end of, of 73 into 74, he's, um, he's talking about psychiatric power, but he introduces Bentham's panopticon. What does he introduce Bentham's? Bentham's panopticon isn't a prism. And anybody who, who, who narrows it down to thinking the panopticon, panopticism is a prism, uh, mistakes the project. Um, uh, panopticism is an invention by Bentham as a mechanism for, um, for managing families, the military, schools, workhouses, whatever. Um, and Foucault goes into great detail about the breadth of concerns that pan panopticism covers. Uh, and I think it's um, it's it's very. Um, I I remember when discipline and punish came out. Um, I, I I I remember the the, the when, when the English translation appeared in um, I'm Australian, so I was in Sydney at the time, and um, uh, and um, uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. For, 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 for those, and it truly did, in the sense that uh, for those who attended Foucault's Collège de France lectures, it didn't come out of nowhere. He had been researching this very topic for three years. Uh, but those lectures um, uh, from Collège de France weren't even, trans weren't even uh, printed, published in French until the new millennium. And they weren't translated to English until a few years ago. In fact, the, the, the last of the Foucault's lectures from the College de France, lecture course of College de France to be translated was the second one, the second one he gave in 1971, 72, 
which was translated two years ago. Um, so uh, th those, those who are engaging with Foucault, uh, his, books, his books were published and translated quickly, but the lecture courses were not. And we th all, everybody thought the books were, what, were the only thing to, to work with. But when you look at the lecture courses, you realize he'd been working on this stuff for a long time. That's why, that's why I suggest go look at the final lecture in the Punitive Society to get a sense of how Foucault is shifting radically a notion of what constitutes power. I, I mentioned this because Tony said it was a question people had in the group. Well, well, isn't power coercive? Doesn't power control you? Do, do, doesn't the teacher have power and the student doesn't? Uh, isn't that what power is? Isn't power a substance that we have or don't have? And uh, uh, that, that final part of that lecture course clarifies some of these things. Um, a couple, uh, and, or we're almost out. Um, one other thing for everybody to look at is, um, uh, and, and you're really fortunate, Foucault gave lots and lots of um, uh, interviews and he, gave, he wrote short, short texts and lectures and whatever. Um, and they're published in three volumes. And um, one, of the, one of the volumes is aesthetics, one of them is power, and one of them is methodology and epistemology. Now, the one on power is downloadable from, the entire thing is downloadable from the internet. And there are two texts in that, uh, it's, it's 400 pages long, so by all means, don't read it. Um, but, but there's two, two texts I really do suggest you read, as, um, uh, not, not just you, but the whole group, because you're big on the screen, but everybody else is still small. Um, uh, 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 that, that now we're back. Um, uh, one, one is, one is uh, the very first piece of writing in that, in that text, in, in that publication. It's called Truth and Juridical Forms. Um, you might say, oh, what's that got to do with anything? In, in 1973, Foucault gave a lecture tour in Brazil of all places, in Rio de Janeiro. He gave a whole series, 13 lectures, I think. And five of the lectures were under a heading, Truth and Juridical Form. Now, what these five lectures do in the most beautifully encapsulated way is they're a summary of Foucault's first three or four College de France lecture courses. Um, and they are extremely powerful in, in explaining where Foucault is coming from with respect to the relation between truth, power, and knowledge. And so I, I, I recommend that one. The other one I recommend is uh, a question of method in which a bunch of um, historians who are really not convinced about Foucault ask him some really tough questions about what are you doing? And he explains himself really clearly in what it is he's doing with respect to <coughs> Again, questions of power, knowledge, and truth. Um, ju just, just to finish up, uh, on, on the issue of power, Foucault, Foucault talks about the expression is uh, a power knowledge dispositive. Often the word's not translated into English, dispositive, but power knowledge Dispositive, dispositive sometimes is translated into English and it's translated as a kind of assemblage, a power knowledge assemblage. That is, but, but what's important for Foucault is that it's not because we know a lot that we are powerful, but because we exercise power, or should I say the exercise of power produces our forms of knowing. The exercise of power produces our forms of knowing. The dispositive, that, 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 that producing is a practice. 
The practice is somewhere. The dispositive, the assemblage, is what Foucault gives the name of, he gives the name to it of institution. So an institution is the where, what I earlier mentioned as, if you like, the tertiary space of a power knowledge relation. So power, power is exercised somewhere on something. And the relations of force produce that something as something knowable. If you think of the institutional site of education or the clinic or the prison, it's shot through with a whole assemblage of forces and counter forces that produce different kinds of forms of knowing and different kinds of subjects of knowing. We are produced by these relations of force. Power is not coercive, it's productive. Why well, I, I, I always ask my I used to always used to ask my students this when I gave lectures on like this. I'd say, so why are you here? Did anybody make you? You think it's important to be here? You think you you think what you might you might learn something or what? I don't know. Why are you here? Nobody did anybody like it's not coercive, it's productive. It's it's not that Foucault says. Power is not knowable, not visible, unless there is resistance. It's only in resistance that power is knowable. So in that sense, um, we are always subject to an exercise of power. Uh, there is no outside to that. Freedom is not an outside to relations of force. Freedom is a mutation in the relations of force or what we, the relations of force produce something that we might call freedom. Um, anyhow, um, I'll leave it on that somber, really sad note that there's no such thing as freedom, gosh. Uh, but, but no, that's why Foucault changed his tune um, by 1980 to say, it's not power I'm dealing with, it's subjects. Because he revises that notion of freedom. That he's, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen um, Colin Gordon's book, Power Knowledge. It got produced, it got published in 1980. And it's, uh, it deals with, interviews and some writings Foucault did between 72 and 77. Hey, that's a really hot time when Foucault is dealing with power. Um, 1980, gosh, you, you, you junk all of this stuff then because he shifts his tune entirely. Um, and and, and he, he, does it, he does it because in, in a sense, he realizes he's backed himself into a corner that's really, really hard to get out of when he says, um, uh, there is no outside to relations of force. There is no, no outside to it. Um, okay, uh, and I, I think it's very interesting to see where Foucault goes after discipline and punish, but we'll have to leave that for another day. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, there's so much for us to, I think- you, you guys won't believe how much I prepared and how little I said. <laughs> Honestly, you know, I, I just said, oh, I'll talk about that, I'll talk about that, I'll talk about that. And, and, um, uh, and I, I hardly talked about anything. <laughs> but that's the way it is. From our perspective, you talked about quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. I wanted to ask if anyone wanted some uh, follow-up questions or points of clarification or anything while we have Mark here with us. <laughs>
And if we're lucky, uh, and Mark, you have the time, we'll have you, once we're done with the book as well, um, just to carry on uh, with what you've already prepared. Uh, um, you mean at the end? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Yeah, no, only too happy to. You know, um, uh, I, I, I really miss this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're very fortunate and grateful to have you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so if there's, if there are any immediate questions? Really? Um, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no. Uh, no, I was just gonna say something really inane along the lines of, I've got a zillion questions. But yeah. I, could we maybe, uh, Mark, if it's okay with you, um, I could either, I could collect your questions and send them to Mark, um, or I can create some sort of forum in which we're all able to communicate. Um, and, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll talk yeah, yeah. more yeah. about that, Mark. Um, it shouldn't be too, too onerous or anything. Um, and even that way, that might, spark an ongoing conversation yeah. that happens in the margins of our meetings, which would be cu quite nice as well. Mm. Um, so going forward, let's, we'll, I'll put something together for that. And Mark, I'll be in touch with you a little bit more about that. Um, and so, yeah, if you would all just um, thank me, thank Mark for uh, being with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. No, All right. Bye. Bye.